So we, I believe that we have really dealt with this what was all about and this kind of thing. Now we are going into the next section, section two, and it has to do with theories. Remember, we said that a lot of people define law in various ways. They had, uh, they had their ways of defining laws. And these things, these things were like theories. Theories, they are post legs. When we call them theory, it means it's what they thought. It's their, what they thought from their mind uh, in sciences. It is not scientifically proven. So they have these theories written down. So we we'll look at them. There are several generally accepted theories concerning the origin of law. A theoretical viewpoint governs the way that a social phenomenon is seen and understood. The theory of law means where law came from, why it developed as it did. So, this is what this theory is talking about. Now, theoretical perspective of law. There are a lot of them by different writers. So we are going to look at those writers. In order to satisfactorily answer the question, what is law? One was delve into jurisprudence. You know, in law, there are a lot of uh, channels. We are now seeing another one, same jurisprudence. Juris is a Latin word for law. So it has to do with an environment, state state, the kind of law that governs that particular state. The kind of law that is in place in Nigeria is not the kind of law that is obtained in England, US, or even Af Afghanistan. There are different, those areas are all jurisdictions and they have their own jurisprudence. So, jurisprudence is the study of legal philosophy, legal philosophy since philosophy consists of one's belief about something. A full answer to the initial question, what is law, is provided by examining the belief, the belief of distinguished writers to see what they perceive law to mean. Now, like I said before, a lot of Theoristies they have came up with their own ideas, the way they see it, the way they view law. And we are going to look at some of these things because they became so important that they brought about a lot of input into the development of law as a cause. A various release of writers on law have come to be known as philosophies of law, schools of jurisprudence, and theories of law. There are different theories and school of thoughts. One, we have natural law theory, theory, we have positive law theory, we have pure theory, we have historical theory, we have sociological theory, we have material <coughs> theory, we have the functional theory and the race theory. These are theories. Uh, that I know. So we are going to look at this theory uh, one after the other so that uh, uh, within the space of time we have, we are able to look at uh, their characteristics, what they are talking about. One, the national law theory. National law theory holds that there are universal moral standards that are inherent in mankind throughout all times. Natural, universal, accepted norms. Somebody just came up and saw it happening in the, his environment. You know, he began to, because of what he met on that, what he saw as a result of his going to be in that environment, he will begin to model himself in line with that kind of character. And once he defeats society within that environment, he it as going the wrong way. So, this kind of concept, you know, starts from the universal moral life. Human beings are not taught natural laws per se, but rather we discover it 
by constantly making choices for good instead of evil. That's natural. Does that give state that what you are doing is right? What are doing is wrong? Whether it is or not, you know that those things are not the norms in the society. Those things span from natural law. Some schools of thought believe that natural law is passed to humans via divine presence. Though, although natural law mainly applies to the realm of ethics and philosophy, you know, like I said, it's something that you will just you just go to see, begin to obey it, you know, uh, not that they are qualified, but by qualification, I mean reading them anywhere. But you took um, you saw them, you saw the people, the way people were doing it, and you began to and you abide it. That's what natural law is talking about. So I believe the natural law to all people have inherent rights conferred not by the act of legislate, legislation, but by God. Now, law by legislation means the law that where the legislators sit together, look at the beefs, and after you know uh, deliberations, pass the beefs and make it a law. But in this natural law we are talking about, it is not that kind of rigorous activity. It just came as a result of nature, as a result of one more fees and seeds in the environment. So, by nature, they say it comes from God or by reason. Natural law is simply what is right, just, and fair. The proponent of natural law theory as Zeno, Thomas, Aquinas, and going to these are major components of this law. So, you can read more of them, it's very, very important. The natural law has been the basis, no, natural law has been the basis for for an array of liberation struggles in ancient days. If I just go there, we go to them to understand how this natural law came to place and how it helped to build what we call the body of laws now. Let's go to the next slide. We have some criticism on this natural law. Some people say no. Ah, what they are saying about natural law is not true. They have a counter opinion. But that doesn't make it not to be relevant. So the reason why we say you as a student of law, you can if only look at them, make their own input, you can criticize it. So so tomorrow you can come up with theories and people will criticize you. So there are some cases, criticisms. Criticism that we needed to look at briefly by some of the philosophers. He said there are numerous criticisms on the theory of law. The national law philosophers looked to the right reasoning as a guide for designing the most perfect forms of law. You know, right reasoning. I want to do something that is right, that comes from the ethics. You know, it should be pointed out. It's a criterion. That cannot be verified through every cause scrutiny. You cannot measure it. You cannot say eh, the, the level of what I know to be right is the same thing with the next person nearby. It cannot be measured, it cannot be let down. So that is the challenge. Unlike the codified law, law written in the books. Once you be here stealing, you know that stealing is stealing. That's the law. So, but this one is, it can be said to vary in different perspectives. So, it cannot be thoroughly, you know, scrutinized. Another weakness of the natural law is what is called multiple conscious problem. I've already explained that. So, what I mean as my conscience may not be able to feeling that is the same. So these are the problem. And totally, uh, the theory could be could lead to anarchy. If anyone is left to act according to the notion of what he feels is right. You know, I feel that packing my vehicle in front of this place, in front of the gangway there, is the right thing to do. I'll just pack it and leave. Some other person will come and say, no, this is not supposed to be so. That uh, but right inside me, I feel that it is the right thing to do. So if we allow this kind of law, you know, there's going to be variety of opinions. 
And at the end of the day, it will need to have that. So, and that will be the end of the society. We now go to into the next theory, and that is the positive theory of law. And this theory of law is started by John Austin, or many people call him J. Austin. He proposed the command theory of law, which is regarded to as positive school, according to him and his book. And the progress of jurisprudence determined. He defined, that's the name of the book, he defined one as command sent by Spiro to refuse and enforced by sanction. Sent by Spiro to refuse and enforced by sanction. You know, that is his own division of law. But this decision means that the only thing that can be regarded as law are those. I do that I let that my person authorized to do so. The definition has the flowing elements. One, the existence of definite sovereign. Who is the sovereign? A sovereign is a set of authority backed by law. We are somebody is regarded as the head. Rather is to put, for instance, we say Nigeria is a sovereign state. Who is the head of the sovereign state? You have a president. So he's saying that this kind of law, this kind of law economy is such that the people that are in the helm of authorities, they issue this law to regulate the activities of the inferior, the people that are they are ruling, you know, the people that are governing, and follow it up with sanction because you cannot issue a rule without uh, sanction. So the sovereign is without legal limitation in the exercise of his power. They can do anything as long as his organ has said it is final. So that's in the state of what he's talking about. The subject must be in the habit of obeying him because of his class power to impose sanctions. He has the power, the sovereign has the power to, to, to force or enforce such kind of law. And then the Australian division of law has been decided on many grounds. That is, we are talking of the, the theory of, uh, as written by uh, John Austin. First, these are the criticism. Laws are not always harsh in an imperative language, such as shall, shall not, as propounded by Austin. Austin's theory says that. There are those that shall, that shall not, like a command, which must be obeyed. So, but the Christians say no. Laws are not always like that. Laws must have a soft point. A soft point. It must have some, you know, some element of, you know, uh, uh, not just threat and sanctions, but elements of peaceful disposition to make it work. Now, the second criticism against this, uh, this theory says that law is what the sovereign says it is. That is, any authoritative lawmaker acting within the scope of his lawmaking power has to be obeyed. Whether he's wrong or not, you must obey. Once the issue comes from the authority, it must be obeyed. No. So, a, a school of thought says no, that uh, it does not examine the goodness and badness of the rules. So, which means the authority might come up and say, everybody in this environment must be key. I say because he has given an order, everybody must be key. So, these things are the deficiencies that we have in this uh, theory as promoted, as uh, postulated by uh, J. Austin. So, all the positive laws are concerned about is whether the lawmaker is legally authorized lawmaker. Against the background, it does not require much in my days to realize that the theory can be can be a discussion for dictatorship and uh, totalitarianism. We have had some uh, histories of where this kind of attitude, like in the realm of uh, people like Hitler, they became absolutely powerful because they were operating this kind of they had this kind of mentality of law, uh, according to J. Austin. It is, it has not gone well. Such societies are bound to fail. 
the dictatorship will not last because people will, will definitely revolt against it. The third reason is the idea of an uncommanded commander is only possible in absolute dictatorship, where the society is governed not by law but according to the wins and caprices of the dictator. Nobody, including the sovereign, is above the law, even under the military government. So these are the, some of the criticisms. The next slide. The first criticism. As we miss the point, when he was said that everybody usually obeys the law because of fear of sanction by the sovereign. That was what he said, that in fact what makes people uh, obey the law is because of the sanction. But it is not always right. People may decide to obey because of uh, their own feeling. People might begin because we obey the law uh, because of uh, what they think about the society. People may still say they are not going to obey the law. If you miss killing them, you can go ahead to kill them. So these things, he said, many obey the law not because of sanction, yes, but because it accords with their normal way of life and because they see it as logical and agree with it in place. For example, not all smokers refrain from smoking in public places because of the existence of law that prohibits smoking in public places. Similarly, not everyone refrains from committing murder because it is punishable under the law, irrespective of the existence of law. So either by natural inclination or belief are not predisposed to smoking in public or killing their fellow human beings. We've already explained that. So we go to the next theory. The theory is the pure theory of law. The theory is a theory presented by Professor Hans Kessin. Uh, he, he, he disagrees with the command theory. He said no to command theory. That's the command theory of uh, Jail's name. Um, and the sky is at most sensical. Like I said, these are different ideologies. Different people seeing the law from various perspectives. Imagine another prof saying that all Jane Austen have done is successful. You know, let's look at what he is talking about. For person, law is a system of norms. A law is valid if it has been created by a norm, which he said has been created by a higher norm within the legal order. That's his own line of thought. The logical connection of norms in this order will continue until we arrive at non law created entity, which is the ground norm. One norm to the other, the smaller to the bigger, until we have a ground norm. Like in Nigeria, for instance, you say the ground norm of the country is the constitution. That every other thing you are doing, once it is not in line with the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which is the ground norm, it will not be implemented. So, ground norm. Is the basis, is the main thing. So, why every other law is generated from the ground law and their validity is traceable to it? The original validity of ground law is traceable, is not traceable to any law. Thus, the law forbidding the killing of another person is, in certain circumstances, a black and murder is valid because it is laid down in criminal code. The criminal code is valid because it was enacted by the legislature. The law made by the legislature is valid because the legislature, the legislature has been constituted and is functioning in accordance with the relevant law. The constitution is valid because it has been promulgated into law as an act of the people. You look at the sequences of how these things, you know, work. You cannot say you have a governor who is now talking on giving an order and people will obey it without having a law backing it. Before he became a governor, there is a law that was enacted that the people say we want to have a government system where we have the presidency, the state, 
And every four years, we will come together and conduct the election. Without that, he will not emerge. And once that four years elapses, there is nothing that will make him to stay more than a day, even a half hour in that office. That is the law. So that is what he's trying to say. That these laws are creating the higher law. The main argument of pure theory of law is that the legal validity of each rule is that means simply by reference to the question whether it has been laid down or considered in accordance with whatever requirements are stipulated by the legal system in question. The theory has been criticized as normal. There must be criticism. We've seen what he said. And then we are going to look at briefly look at the criticism. Uh, the first criticism, the first person, the first person says, on the ground that expresses the former validity of law rather than this function and the fed in society. That's the first criticism. That the interest of Professor Kersley is on the former validity of the law and not this function or this effect in the society. That is the theory of law consignment said with the content of the law. Instead, he's just talking about just, all right, moral, immoral, any rule that's a fact or former criterion to be selected will be regarded as law. You know, that's his own opinion. And people are looking at it. So, to this extent, it has failed to address issues that touch and concern the existence of humankind and may serve as a ready tool for dictatorship. Again, we are people are narrowing down to dictatorship just like it was in the in the case of uh, uh, just uh, J. Austin. So because people will always want to have control over others. And any law or any tool or school of thought that and not being able to tackle this area has a lot of deficiency, just as what is being seen in this one too. The second is not easy. It is not easy, if not impossible, to determine the grammar in the modern society. The fiction that the constitution is the grammar is only a legal fiction because it can be proved further. Like I said before, that the uh, constitution is grammar. Uh, but this postulation is not saying that it can, it, it, it has to be queried. So who created the constitution? In the process, in the context of the Nigerian experience, the military or the people, we took that answer. How did the constitution we are using in Nigeria, the constitution of 1999, that you know people are now beginning to amend? How did it came into place? You know, is it the military or the people? Why the agitation? It means that something is wrong somewhere. And uh, the third theory of constitution that the constitution is not known may hold good when there is abiding faith in the legal order. During the revolutionary change of government, the validity of a norm depends on the effectiveness of legal order and not the constitution. For instance, before now, in the in the country. Middle East, we have a country called Af Afghanistan. They have a system of government uh, that before now have been in existence, being championed by the government in Kabul. But recently, there was a revolt and uh, a group known as Taliban pulled down the system of government. They have a constitution, but because there is a revolt, the so-called constitution was thrown out of you know, power and uh, the Taliban came up with their own power. So he has justified what these critics, critics are saying that uh, in a situation like that, constitution will no longer be a problem. So the next one. The historical theory of law is another school of thought. The theory was provided by Frederick Carl Savinji. Carbon Savigi, a German, a German aristocrat. The theory was propounded in order to counter the influence of natural theory of law in overthrowing monarchs in the 17th and 18th century Europe. The theory 
is of the view that laws should be made in accordance to the custom of the people. The custom referred to as votis is the spirit of the people which binds them together. Thus, attempts, attempts should not be made to make laws that will deviate from the custom and the ways of life of the people. So, what is Saban saying? He's saying that law ought to emanate from the custom of the people. How people do their own things, what is, you know, common in their own environment, not just throwing up uh, a law added to the environment. That's his own postulation. That law ought to emanate from the custom, the people's way of life. That is own. So one of the things that against this school of law is the fact that it is followed, it followed dogmatically. It will hinder radical reforms, which will turn out to be good for the society. You know, for instance, like I said, I gave an example of uh, what is happening in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, Afghanistan for, for example, women are allowed to, uh, they're not allowed to drive, uh, they're not allowed to, to move freely in the society without a male counterpart. You know, those things are only to foreign, to, to the modern society. But you see such things in place, mandated from the custom of the people over the people. So he is saying that these things are what ought to give way to the body. He is saying no. Now, this kind of thing means that the rights of people will be infringed upon. For instance, the way it's being done in the country aforementioned. One can only imagine how backward the society will be if strange custom like slavery, absolute monarch, monarch. Monarch, we are not abolished. You can, you know, feel the impulse if you can recall what it means for somebody to be enslaved, 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 emanating from one's custom. I'm going to do this now. Another piece of this theory of law is the fact that it is not at all times that customs are fair and just. There are a lot of customs that segregate a particular class of people. For instance, in India, where the poor people, the task, the slaves and all these things, these are people that we are better equal. But look at their custom. Some people are viewed as more important or more human than others, which is not supposed to be. So to so be as such. So in such in such in such cases, you discover that uh, there is a lot of person that segregates as classes of people. If this theory is to be followed to the letter, it will put these people into perpetual bondage. In Nigeria, customary laws are only applicable where they are deemed to satisfy the three major tests. The tests are if it is not repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience. You can look, check the evidence as section 18. Contrary to the public policy, incompatible directly or by necessary implication with any law for the time being enforced. And social theory. Social theory was uh, considered by Jane as the pan. So they were the pro prominent scholars. Under the social school of law, according to them, the relationship between law and society as societal conduct, and that each has effect on the other. The societal conduct that means the rule laid down in legal sources such as status and society is necessary. Societal value and conduct that means the meaning of law and not the rules laid by the sovereign. Therefore, they say it was. It, it was the view of war. Therefore, any was of the view that one could not appreciate the law of the society by many religions into the former legal stuff. Rather, one should go to the society to understand how the law is obeyed in God, executed, modified, or supplemented by the society. Why conduct can infringe the law as argued? By this school. This school is talking about that conduct 
and it explains the law. So he hinges his own line of thought about the conduct that can always influence the law. And Pam, anybody, uh, Pam was a former dean of Harvard's law school. So he's where he has a different idea of social, sociology called school that is different from energy. His argument is based on completing claims that society, given the limited resources available for use, according to him, and satisfying human wants, balancing, balancing is necessary among the competing claims in such a way to avoid disruption in established institutions. The institutional emphasis here will be that the cost system will be that of the cost system and other arms of government. And attaches great weight on value system. His major point is on value system. What the society tends to value. However, Pan's theory of balancing competing claims failed to provide a scientific approach in assessing this. His argument appears to attach more weight to value, which would prevail against what is right and fair. However, Pan's analysis of balancing has received some attention in law courts as means of resolving. As means of resolving competing claims. This is what Pan is talking about. Now, the analysis of social school of law, however, also has its own share of criticism. As usual, like I said, you always see people will not always agree with all these thoughts. And what is the first thing? He says, it is not all the time that conduct influences law. There are situations in which Law influences the conduct. That's what the school is saying. That's the first place is saying there are situations where the reverse is the case, not always the way they have put it. So there are situations in which law influences the conduct of members of the society. For instance, vehicle owners register their vehicles because of law mandating them to do so. That's why they register their vehicle. Another reason is the fact that it is quite risky to go with the flow. Just because every one person, every other person is obeying the law, will not excuse an offender who is caught and is being made an escape route. So, that like every other person is disobeying the law, you know, is not an excuse for that. Let me go and do the same thing. And once that person can become uh, an escape route. So, that's one of the criticisms. So, it doesn't flow with social. Then, the next line, next theory of law is said, uh, Intellectual law, theory of law. And the chief component of this law theory is uh, Jer Jeremy Better. According to his theory, law should encourage communal, communal utilities, which is in this which is which in this context is about people's happiness. This part is talking about what makes people happy. So law have to do with what makes people happy. But, you know, do we say that, okay, let's look at it, and uh, the greatest good of the greater member of the people should be the basis of making appropriate life in society. That is what we are trying to do. five, four major utilities, which include security, equality, liberty, and abundance. To attain the retirement goal, the law must balance the individual interest with that of familiar interest. The freedom of individuals can be sacrificed or curtailed to achieve greater good for the society. For example, the law allows for the police to invade the privacy of suspected armed robbers, robbing him of his liberty in order to guarantee the security of the society. The main criticism of this school, like as there has always been criticism, he said the main criticism of this school is that. It does not resolve the issue of balancing both, both individual and community interests. Neither does it state how best to achieve this. Now, he is talking about, he is talking about, uh, no, no. he is talking about the community interest against individual interest. 
he was stressing on the communal interest. But the issue is that when you be in people or individual interest as a lot of communal interest, you are impeding on people's side. So that's the major challenge you have. So let's go to the next slide. The functional theory. The theory of law, this theory of law is championed by the distinguished, distinguished United States jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. His view is that law is what the court says it is. He said the law should be viewed from the perspective of the bad man, according to him. The bad man doesn't give two roots about legal theories. All he cares about is what the court will decide in his situation. <laughs> he views the court, he views the, his own line of law. Law, what the law should be talking about, is about bad man, you know, in quotes, wrongdoer. Because what the wrongdoer is interested in knowing is what will the court say about this issue? Will they charge me? Will they sentence me? That is what the man that is committing a uh, crime is thinking about. And this school of law is talking about, you know, based on this feeling of this man. So this is not just determining what is contained in the stat status, since it is the court that has the way that with the law. The law will be what the court pronounced it to be. That's why you go, you give the same matter, uh, the same matter, the same issues, the same everything to different judges. Their pronouncement, their judgment by value, you know, because they see it from various angles. At the end of the day, you may receive conflicting judges because the conflicting judgments as a result of the way the juries view it. One of the criticisms against this school is that it only concentrates on the cost and it loves, ignores the legislative and administrative authority. This is arguably erroneous, considering the fact that the court itself is a creation of the status. Imagine the court, you know, will now be issuing order against the the, the, the institution that made him. So it's unfortunate, but that is what the problem that is associated with functional theory of law. The next theory of law, the realist. The next school is of American origin and is described to be people like this is subscribed to by people like Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jerome Frank. John Chapman, Greg, and Carl, a lot of them. This school posits that law is not just what is in the book and the silent cases. They are all they are on the field that the judge and jury in making their decisions are influenced by external forces. Judges may be influenced and affected by excludable factors, much more than the evidence adduced in trials and arguments of the parties. In deciding a case, judges may be affected by the way of life, emotional background, what they did, like or dislike, color or age. For example, if a judge that has been a victim of rape or is close to a victim tries an accused rapist, there is every likelihood that she will want him to go scot free due to her. Previous issue. That, that, sorry, there is every likelihood, likelihood that she will not want him to go scot free due to her previous experience. Also, a judge who is handling the trial of a former colleague will be lenient compared to the trial of an accused who is not related to him. It's just very simple. We are talking of, they are talking of the human factor in the oppressions of the judges. Their state of mind, their experiences in life, and also even their family issues, you know, which can crop up, you know, as a human being, they will call you know, all those things to the top. <coughs> and uh, those things will eventually influence their line of thought for the day. Now, this school aims at reforming the judicial system. 
your review that the judges should constantly try their best in order to be objective in deciding a particular case. Scholars have argued that there is no such thing as raised school and that the so called rules are experimentalist and construct and constructive and sociological concept to jurisprudence. So these are some of the things they are talking about. They is majorly on how to you know condition the mind of uh, uh, judges. For instance, that's why in Nigerian system, judges are not allowed to get involved in most societal activities, public interviews, and all this, so that they can be able to attain to take the extraneous factors that may influence the opinion of the judge over his case down to the next slide. Conclusion. It is opposite to state that many of the philosophers who postulated their both theories came from significant diverse backgrounds and orientation. A good number of them came from academies of various disciplines, including law, history, and philosophy, and so forth. Others at least judges and so forth. The difference is in their orientation, background, and experiences. No doubt inform their major concept of law from different viewpoints. An example is that <coughs> is that a legislator, a legislator's concept of law might be quite different from that of judge. Same applies to a clergyman that in his analysis of law in comparison with an accused standing trial in court. Given the development, it is rather safe to submit all definitions are relatively arbitrary and accurate. No definition is universally accepted, and there is no definition of law to end all definition. So, which means, paramountly, some other skills of law can still emanate tomorrow. So, it depends on the environment. 